Hello everyone, my name is Daniel and I'm a programmer and an artist, and today I wanted to, to do a video that was a continuation or a part two of the last video I did about the vector math node, and I wanted to go over the last few um, operations that I used from it, what they do, and how you can think about um, how they work. So in the last video we covered addition, subtraction, and multiplication, or scaling, which is multiplication by a float. Um, what I want to go over today are the other operations that I use most often, which would be cross product, dot product, and length. I might also mention project, reflect, and refract, just because even though I don't really, I don't think I've ever used them, um, I was just experimenting with them and they're kind of interesting. And then as far as all the other operations, I don't really um, use them very often, but you could experiment with them, set up something with the draw some lines to some points and experiment and see what they do if you're interested. So the first one is project, and essentially what it seems to do is it takes the second vector the vector that goes in the bottom socket, and you, that's just a direction that extends forever. And then it will project the first vector onto it in such a way that the there will be a 90 degree angle from the end of the, the resulting vector towards the point of the first input vector. So we can see that if we turn this orange line on and we move this around, you can see there's always a 90 degree angle from the end of the yellow vector to the red vector. So that's kind of interesting. It's not one I've used before, but I just was experimenting and thought that was kind of cool. Now those are all kind of interesting, but those aren't really operations I've used before. Um, one I have used a lot is cross product. And the reason cross product is useful is because it returns a vector that's perpendicular to both of the input vectors. So of course that means you can imagine if you have this blue vector as an axis perpendicular to that blue vector in 3D space, there's anything around the x-axis, right? All of this is perpendicular. But then if you were to add in the second vector, there's only two of all of those orientations around the x-axis that are perpendicular to both, and that's straight down and straight up. And depending on the order that you put these into the socket, you'll get one or the other of those. So if the blue comes before the red arrow, it points up. If the blue comes after the red arrow, it points down. And if you were to come in here and swap the order of these, you'd get the opposite direction. So that's very useful if you're working with normals and you want to know a direction that goes across the normal. I can show that in a second. Now if you don't normalize the result of the cross product when the two input vectors are aligned the length of the resulting vector will be very short and the more perpendicular they are the longer it gets. And you can see when you cross over this line that's the opposite of the red vector it switches from pointing down to pointing up. So here I have an example of one way you can use the cross product for something. And that is if you have a face here with a normal, the normal obviously points in this direction. So then if you take the cross product of the normal with Z, so up on, or one in the Z directions, which would be a vector that points straight up like this. Um, then you get a vector that points across the plane in some way. So if you rotate this, you can see it always points sideways. Well, then if you take the cross product of that vector and the original normal vector, you'll get a vector that points downwards but across the surface of the plane. So, like, try to slide. It's sort of like the direction something would slide if you dropped it on the plane. You can see that here. If I rotate it this way, it, it'll slide that way because that's the most sloped down. So like I said, the way I think about it and visualize that is um, you have two input vectors. If you just imagine that making like a plane, then the results are either going to be the normal of that plane or the opposite of the normal of that plane. So I think that concludes it for uh, the operations that return another vector. Um, I think the rest of the operations return a float or a value. So let's switch over to looking at some of those. So I have my result yellow result here now will output text as a value. Um, and let's switch this to the dot product because that's the first one. Now I know with the dot product that there's a lot more you can do with it that I don't understand. Um, so just be aware of that. If you really understand how to use it, you can use it as part of an equation to find like the nearest point on a line that's closest to a point and stuff like that. I don't quite understand how all of that works. What I do know about the dot product is you can use it to compare the similarity of two vectors. So that's essentially how I think about the dot product. It's like, how similar are these two input vectors? 
As far as being able to tell how similar two vectors are, if you just use the normal vectors, you'll get really large values because the dot product is some kind of multiplication. Um, I think it's the first vector's x times the second vector's x plus the first vector's y times the second vector's y plus the first vector's z times the second vector z, but I could be wrong about that. Anyway, it doesn't matter though because you can make the result more predictable and the way you do that is by before doing the dot product if you normalize. Oftentimes too when you do this you're comparing some vector to the normal of a face on a mesh and the normal of a face on a mesh is already normalized so that helps. But if you normalize the two input vectors before you do the dot product because a normalized vector is in length is always one the result of the dot product of those two vectors whose length is exactly one is never going to be greater than one or you could say it's, it's going to be in the negative one to one range and it will be one when the vectors are perfectly aligned like this and then the length of it doesn't matter obviously and it will be zero if it's perpendicular like this and we can see that if we rotate this around the x-axis you can see it stays zero no matter what angle you point it at and then it will be negative one if it points in the opposite direction. So that's very useful for making selections and things. For example, here if we add a sphere and we put a new geometry node set up on it. And we say we just want to select the bottom of this, this sphere. We can do a separate geometry here. We can separate faces and we can say the normal dot product is greater than zero and then we can say one so our input vector is up on the z-axis and we say the dot product is of the normal dot up on the z-axis is greater than zero well then we get all of the upward facing faces and if we look at the opposite we get the bottom and then you could increase that to get select less or decrease it to select more and it's based on kind of the angle of the face rather than a position in space. Because obviously you could do the same. You could say like, well, if the position separate x, y, z, z is greater than zero, right? You get the same thing. But then if you move your mesh around, it breaks. Whereas this is based on the dot product, which is more considering the direction the face is pointing relative to the, whatever vector you're comparing it to. And so it's consistent no matter where in the mesh um, you're working on. So I'd say the most common ways I use dot product is to select um, like the upward facing or downward facing parts of a mesh, whether that's because I want to extrude them or um, move them or whatever else the case may be. So as an easy example of how that could be useful, it's like maybe you have some uh, plants you want to scatter on a terrain or something, but you only want them to scatter on the flat upward facing parts of the terrain and not on the cliffs. And so you could use when you have, say, distribute points on faces node or something, you can put a selection into that. And that selection could be this sort of setup here where you have the normal dot up on the Z axis and you could have some greater than threshold to select how upward facing a face had to be to get, you know, grass or plants or whatever scattered on. All right, so then just the last couple operations. Um, well, I mean, really the last one I use is the length operation, and it just tells you how long a vector is. So this vector is four long, this vector is three long. Normally the way I use the length vector is um, if I'm doing a subtraction. So that gets you a direction vector between these two. So this vector here. And then if you wanna know how far away those two points are from each other, you can plug the result of that subtraction into the length vector. So now we know that this point and this point are 4.4 meters apart. Um, why I do it that way, I don't really know because you could also use the distance operation, which does the exact same thing. But I guess oftentimes you might have a use for that direction vector anyway. So then rather than having to calculate the direction vector and then also calculate the distance to get the length, you could also just plug the direction vector into the length vector and get it that way. And obviously that's useful because oftentimes you just want to know how far away two points are or so whether you use the subtract and then the length node or you use the distance node, just having that information is often 
useful for things like if you're making an array, you want to know how far apart to put elements or, you know, stuff like that. All right, um, I think that covers it for the vector math node. Um, I want to continue this and do uh, another video where I talk about selections and indexes because as I pointed out in the last video, I think those are sort of the sort of the fundamental building blocks that if you really understand them, lets you do a lot of other things. So I, I think I want to do a video going over the basics of those, um, the selection and the indexes, so that there's sort of a groundwork laid. And then from there, maybe I can do a couple videos where I go over some simple examples of um, putting all of those pieces together to make a modifier that um, does something that might actually be useful in the scene. So that's kind of my plan. Hopefully this was interesting and um, I explained everything correctly. There's a lot more you can do with the vector math than what I even understand about it. But um, those are sort of the basics and that's my working knowledge of it that I have and how I kind of think about it. So yeah, that's all I got for this one. Thanks for watching.